This is not the sermon that I'd planned for this week. I'd planned to follow up last week a little, little bit of a discussion of uh, refining dross, that the idea that to live more beautifully is not to do more or less, but to do what we do uh, with, with a character formed by Christ. And, and that was the plan. And then I got back from Baltimore. And plans changed. Wesley Seminary is the group that invited me out to the East Coast for this event. And what they are doing is uh, they believe that it is in urban ministries in the city that you can see the challenges of, of ministry most starkly. And what they do is every year they have a fellowship by which they take 12 seasoned pastors, seasoned, it's a polite way of saying middle-aged, I'm okay with it, uh, to come and, and experience this, well, what, they, what they're doing. The people who have figured out, like, they're not worried about charge conference forms and they've done a few Christmas Eve services, pastors who, who can who have the basics underhand and want them to understand what they're getting at. In Baltimore, the question, the reason they gathered pastors there, these 12 pastors, um, or 11 actually, is uh, to grapple with the question, what does it take to heal a community? It's a real question. That's the type of thing you grapple with in ministry. How do you heal a community that is broken and hurting and sick? And so I spent Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday in Baltimore uh, listening to leaders in the community, I listened to Reverend Hunt, the district superintendent of the 73 Methodist churches, uh, just rotated out of that position, but he was there for, for eight years. Listen to Lieutenant Colonel Briscoe, the highest ranking uh, black woman in the Baltimore Police Force. Uh, she was the one who volunteered to be over the Western District after the riots, after the uh, Freddie Gray's uh, death and the trial unfolded. I listened to Reverend Rodney Doerr, the pastor of Ames United Methodist Memor Ames Memorial United Methodist Church, the church on the corner uh, where Freddie Gray dealt drugs. To say up front, Freddie Gray was no saint. Listen to Dr. Holton, who spent 24 years on the city council and herself as an ordained elder in the AME uh, Method, the Methodist Church. But I'm going to attempt to weave all these together into a story and, uh, and show you maybe a bit about how that changes how I read the story of the Good Samaritan. And, and I promise you I'm going to get a detail wrong, because uh, what I'm doing is weaving together the stories of, of the people who have lived in Baltimore all their lives and what they told me. And so I, I know that the line of the story is solid. I, I'm going to mess up a detail, and I'll just tell you that up front. And, and what I'm sharing with you when I'm talking about the city are the judgments and evaluations of the people who are studying the city from living in the city. And so so for example, in a minute I'm going to tell you that the police are used as the tip of the spear to deal with what uh, the community would rather ignore. That, that's not Andy. That is the evaluation of Lieutenant Colonel Briscoe, who is the in senior, senior officer in the force. That, that it's a, if that sounds different than what we're used to around here, it is, but that, that's their evaluation from people who, who live there. So I want to start telling you about the city, and we start out with an old, old practice, practice of redlining. Has anyone here heard the term redlining before? Excellent. Redlining, it is the practice that began in Baltimore, and then Baltimore taught it to the rest of the cities in America, and they would take what it looks like is you take a map, you draw a line around a block, and you say that's the block where white folk live. You draw, take another line, you draw a line around the map, and you say that's where the black folk can live. And then this was enforced with uh, community covenants. And so if you lived on a white block, to buy a house on a white block, you had to sign a contract that the courts supported and the police enforced that said that you cannot sell this property to a black person. You cannot rent it or lease it. You cannot, th this is a white block done, right? It's called redlining. And uh, it is something I knew about because I'm from near Chicago and it happened near Chicago. I knew it happened near Chicago because after uh, World War II, the, the GI Bill, what's the GI Bill pay for? 
education and housing, right? And so if you came to Chicago and you're a veteran from World War II and you try to buy a house, Chicago's red line too. Like the, Chicago is ca categorized white part of town, black part of town. Well, Baltimore is the first city that, that started doing that. And, and that's when I said, the Lieutenant Colonel Briscoe pointed out it was enforced by the police because the police are the people who handle whatever a community does, would rather ignore. And so that is uh, what shapes Baltimore. For over a century, Baltimore has been a city where the west side of the city is black. The east side of the city is Polish, Italian, and the middle part of the city through the center is white. That is how the city, like if, you, if someone says, gives the, their address of where they live in Baltimore, I can almost guarantee that I can tell you what ethnicity they are based upon the, this practice. It's no longer legal to use these co community covenants and redlining no, no longer officially happens, but it does, right? It's, that's just how, how it is, right? And so, what happens when this is done for a century? How does that shape a population? For a while, it was okay on the west side of Baltimore. West side of Baltimore is called Sandtown, because that's where they got the sand to make the, to make the bricks that built the city. And that's where the African Americans worked. They worked in the brick plant. And, and then after slaves were freed, that's where the freed blacks worked. They worked in a plant, and you know what plant? Blue collar work, it builds community. It builds, uh, that's a way to get into the middle class. You work in a plant. Union, work, you make a good wage, right? That's a solid thing. The brick plant closed. And, and the only other source of blue collar jobs is down here on the harbor. Italians and Polish could work on the harbor, on the docks, not blacks. It was illegal for blacks to work on the dock. And so the entire west side of the city for decades now has not had a source of jobs. They can't leave because they can't buy a house anywhere else. They couldn't afford it, even if they could, because of the, the redlining and the community covenants. And so on the west side, the city starts to fall apart. And as you drive through, if you drive through western Baltimore right now, A, I would, not, I would advise you to stay in your car. B, you'll notice that you will not see a single grocery store. And if you do find, I didn't see a single one while I was there, if you do find a grocery store, three tomatoes will cost you five bucks. Can you, make, can you pay for a family to eat when tomatoes cost five dollars like that? And it's not, another interesting thing about what you don't see, you don't see grocery stores, you don't see banks, Right? And you don't see cars because it takes money to be able to afford a car. And so you drive down these city streets and there aren't any cars parked on the side of the street. It's, it's weird to me. Now, that means everyone has to use trans city transportation. Okay, center part of the city, they have a really nice rail line because that's where the white folk live. This side of the city, it's all buses. Now the buses don't stop, uh, they don't have enough stops since they're not well maintained. And so to get groceries, you have to walk six, seven city blocks to get to your bus stop to get on the bus to go somewhere there is a grocery store. And that's if you can get to the bus stop because the west side of the city is pretty low on the snow removal list. They do the center part of the city first and then they might get to the west side, they might not. Right? So it's pretty hard to get your groceries there. And if you have a job to get your, jo your checks cashed, you don't have any banks. Anyone here ever have to pay to get a check cashed? Right? Rates are pretty high. You have, to you have to pay to get your own money, kind of hurts. The most common stores I saw, alcohol stores and takeouts. And, and the thing about the takeout store, uh, walk in to get a meal, I had a great meatloaf. Walked in and uh, at, we had a meal. And this, the whole uh, restaurant was probably the size from the organ to right here, but you could only get from like here to the chairs because the rest of it was behind a wall of plexiglass so that you pointed at what you wanted and then the guy at the end put your food in a lazy Susan and spun it. First he spun it around so you put your cash in, then take credit cards or, or checks. And then he, he spin it around, he'll take your cash and he'll, he'll spin you your food. So you can actually touch or get close to it all. Now, it takes a while for 10, 15 people to eat like this, to get their food. Lazy Susan is kind of slow. And so while we were doing that, I had time 
to step outside and to look around. And this, th and this is just West Baltimore, just a street on West Baltimore, and I started noticing things like uh, trim lines on paint. Notice this nice crisp trim line? We have contractors around here that if the, the paint had come down on this trim line, we'd say do it again. The trim lines are not crisp on anything I saw because they don't have contractors or local businesses to, to do the painting. Everyone just does their own. And the signs, like if you're going to start a business, you want to have a sign up that's a printed, sharp looking sign. Hand lettered signs. I saw a lot of hand lettered signs up. And, and uh, air conditioning units. Um, there wasn't central AC. A lot of these are 100 year old buildings, right? And so they have window units. The window units on the first floor were all enclosed in steel cages because they could be stolen and then pawned. And so I was looking out there with uh, the pastor, Pastor Rodney, and as he looked around, I couldn't see it, but he could. He said, Andy, I can still see the, the marks from the 1968 riots after the assassination of Martin Luther King Jr. He can see, and it tells you the level of maintenance the city is putting in. The city doesn't really do a lot for that area. Now, the city did try once to do something. In the 1960s, I believe, it was a combination of Dixiecrats and liberals who had control of the city council. They wanted to, to spruce up the west side. And when you have a part of town you want to make look better, if you have something that doesn't look good and you want it to make look, look better on the cheap, what do you do to it? You slap some paint on it, right? A fresh coat of paint makes everything look better. So they painted all the housing projects. Right? What is in the paint that you buy in the 1960s? Lead. lead, right? So all of the projects were covered in lead paint. All the housing units. And if, when lead paint starts to flake, lead is sweet. And so the kids eat it. And so you have an entire generation of children who ate the lead. And there is no safe level of lead. It causes brain damage. Like, I could tell you the statistics, or I could just tell you this. If I thought there was any chance there was lead in that parsonage, I would be moved out tonight. Like, I love you, I'll come back, I'll serve you, I'd be in making like that. Right? We don't mess with lead. That stuff is scary. It, will, it damages children's brains. And this leads to the, a self-reinforcing trend, right? What, are, what funds schools? Property taxes. And so there isn't a lot of property value, and so schools are, aren't receiving. They're poorly funded schools teaching children who have been damaged by lead, a lot of ADHD, stuff like that, developmental disabilities. And what does that, and they're in an area with no jobs because they can't get to the downtown area because they can't get the buses over to the, the rail. And so what happened, what, what type of despair does that lead to? Now, there was a uh, class action lawsuit around the lead and everyone affected by it gets $300. It's e it's either every other month or every other week or every month. I couldn't get the detail of that straight. And I can't tell you how crazy that sounds. If you want to put money into a community to handle a, a challenge like that, who's the last person you want to give a whole bunch of money? 18 year olds on a regular basis a whole bunch of cash does that sound like a good idea like i don't even have teens and i can tell you that's a that's a bad idea and so what happens in part in this community the cops have been used to oppress this people and keep them over here away from the people with authority in the middle part of the city and uh it is known when check check day is this is the day all the checks show up for the lead, the lead checks. And so all the teens and the young adults go and they get their checks cashed. You ever heard of stop and frisk? Right? Stop and frisk is a practice in the city, but whereby if you look suspicious, Charlie, you're looking kind of suspicious, I'm going to stop and frisk you. Looks like you have some money from drugs. And so the cops, it is known that the cops will frisk you and take your money, that the stop and frisk rate goes up on check days. So you have only have $300 of legitimate money because you don't have a job and the cops are taking it on a regular basis. This, this distrust of the cops, this relationship has been there for not just decades, but for a century there. 
Now, about 20 years ago into this hard situation, the first black mayor was elected, Mayor Schmoke, and uh, the city council begins to have some African-American representation. Does it all get better like that? No. It took decades to cause a problem. It, it's not going to get solved in, in just one political term, especially when the local businesses don't help, when they don't buy into changing how things are. In the last 20 years, you may have noticed that there has been a revitalization of the cities. You notice the uh, Kansas City, power and light, right? That, that's new. How old is that now? I don't know. I mean, it's a fairly new, but I know that the revitalization of the cities, uh, Chicago, downtown Chicago is a lot less awkward to get to than it used to be. We've put some serious money into revitalization. Baltimore has had revitalization money. And what happened was the five major families, of, it starts to sound like a, a weird mob thing, right? But the five major cities, uh, five major families of the city controlled where that money was spent, the revitalization money, and it was all spent down the center. So that today, if you went to visit Baltimore, I mean, it's really nice downtown here by the harbor and, and where everyone, the, great, the Marriott was the first uh, hotel that went in down there. And there are some great seafood places. There's an aquarium where you walk down through the shark tank. I mean, it's amazing. Um, that's where I found that really good at Claire. I mean, it, it's really nice. But uh, that's where all the jobs were. That's where all the money is. That's where all the opportunity is. And, and it's designed so that the people living in the center of the city can get down and work it. People on the west side, they just literally can't get there to work the jobs. That's where the buses are. And the buses, as, as of recently, don't connect into the train lines. So, Baltimore has some problems. Rodney Dorr became the pastor of Ames Memorial United Methodist Church about a decade ago. It's on the west side of Baltimore. He showed up, and on the corner of his church was a group of 15 to 20 young men who uh, dealt drugs there. Uh, Freddie Gray was one of them. And he wanted that corner to be free for the work of the church. And so Rodney did... Dude's a preacher. And so he does what preachers do. He went out there and he preached. 7 a.m., 5 p.m., and 9 p.m. Every day. Right? And, and so Rodney goes out there uh, and he preaches on John 3.16 every time. Right? God loves you. And he preaches on John 3.16, 7 a.m., 5 p.m., 9 p.m., every day for three years. Like, loudspeaker, brings his choirs. I mean, this, and after three years, uh, Freddie Gray and this group of people come to him and say, Preacher, what are we going to have to do to get you to stop preaching at us? And he tells them, you've got to move down the block so this corner can be free for the work of the church. And they did. They moved. It is not that long after that, April 2015, that Freddie Gray, on, on a day in which, uh, check day, right? Uh, Freddie Gray, the police get, pay attention to Freddie. They, they're, they're looking at him and he runs, because that's what you do when the cops look at you and you've got your check money, you'd like to hold on to it. And uh, six cops uh, ran him down and beat him broke his back such that in the transport van to the hospital, uh, the transport van, I don't know if he was going to the hospital or to booking, I don't know that detail, but he, he died from his injuries. Uh, six cops beat him, broke his back, he died, uh, and no, none of those cops were convicted. None of them. But that they were free. All the long-term sins, the systemic problems of the city come together in that death, it seems. I, I talking to uh, the mentor for the program, Asa Lee is his name, and uh, I said this, that, I mean, this seems to crystallize all the problems, and he says, Andy, you're not the first person to say that. But what you see in this, Fred, the death of Freddie Gray is the redlining. He has nowhere to go. He's stuck, right? There's no jobs nothing to do. The city budget is ignoring the west side and there's the lead paint that has sabotaged his youth. He was no saint. Dude dealt drugs. Like, a poor life decision. But in that context, whew, right? It's a hard situation. It's complicated, right? This is not what showed up on the news. And when you watch the news a couple, three years ago about this, th this level of complexity was not represented. Stories are always complicated, right? And it was fascinating. I was talking to Lieutenant, Cur Lieutenant Colonel Jackson, another uh, dude on the police force. 
and he was asking about the problems where I live. And I, I, I told him some things, like things that you know, like farming. You end up owning a lot of land, but you don't have a lot of income because, because it costs $700 an acre to put in corn, give or take, and so that your, your margin is really narrow and your equipment's really expensive. I was describing to this lieutenant colonel how wide the front of a combine is, and he had no clue, right? He did not understand the context. Like, he was telling me about the 68 Martin Luther King Jr. riots, and I could tell him about the farm crisis, and we, we didn't, neither of us knew the story of the other. Like, life is always, there's always a story. In the midst of the challenges of this story in Baltimore, there were people who I sat with who gave me hope. People who were dreaming towards the kingdom of God and working towards the kingdom of God with a stubbornness and a belief that Jesus got over being dead and so they can handle what is in front of them. And so Rodney Doerr, the pastor of Ames Memorial Methodist Church, says he's going to build, he is in the process of building a community center so that he can continue to teach more kids a karate and run their scout program, I believe, and have a safe place in the midst of that community. And if this is a man who got up to preach three times a day for three years to clear off his block, that dude's stubborn. He says he's going to get that community center built, and I believe him. Right, it's going to happen. Talk to uh, Lieutenant Colonel Briscoe, the highest ranking black lady in the police force, and, and listening to how she responded after the riots, after um, uh, Freddie Gray's, the officers involved in Freddie Gray's death were, were freed. And uh, she talks about changing the nature of what it means to be a cop such that they understand the, the cops that she leads that you first must serve. You go in, you listen, you apologize for the past, and then you serve right now. Uh, and that is changing. Like, that doesn't sound... Like, the cops around here, we understand them to be servants of the community, and that is not what is the case in Baltimore. And to change it so that the cops understand that if we're going to talk to someone who's hungry, first you have to get them something to eat. Like, this is... It's making a difference. Listening to Reverend Dorr listening to Lieutenant Colonel Briscoe talking about how they, like they're making social contracts with the drug dealers. Like, we all agree that kids are important. I don't agree with you selling drugs. Can, at least, can we at least agree that every kid should get to school safely? Right? And so the cops and the drug dealers of the West Side have this agreement. Right? Kids should get to school safely. It, it's a step forward. But it matters. It gets you somewhere. As I tell this story, I find that it resonates with a story that you have heard often. I have heard often this parable of the Good Samaritan. This story about someone who has been beaten and is on the side of the road and how that person is ignored by the people you'd expect them, expect to stop. And finally, a Samaritan stops to help and gives first aid and transports him and gets him to safety and offers to pay for the cost of the guy healing. What resonates with, about this parable with the situation in Baltimore is that the very nature of the name, we call this the parable of the Good Samaritan. And if you had told a Jew of the first century that, that phrase, Good Samaritan, they would have been confused because there was no such thing as a Good Samaritan. Like This is one of the major ethnic racial cleavages of the first century Jewish community. Because a Samaritan... 12 tribes of Israel, two southern tribes formed the, nation, the kingdom of Judah, 10, 12, the 10 northern tribes formed the, the kingdom of Israel. In Israel, the 10 northern tribes, they fall into idolatry, and then they fall to Assyria. Assyria comes and conquers them, and those 10 tribes are lost to history, right? It's the two southern tribes that go into exile by Babylon, and then come back and rebuild the temple and continue the Jewish people. The 10 northern tribes... They don't disappear, they are systematically bred out. Because what the Assyrians do is they send in men to marry all the women of the Jewish population, and all the children are Samaritans. 
So the Samaritans are looked down on by the Jews. The Jews, the, the remaining Jews of southern Judah, are the people who continue to be faithful to God, whereas those people, they are the ones who were unfaithful, and they lost, and they were cast out, and they are no longer Jewish, right? They are the other. So this uh, bullet on the front of the bulletin is that cartoon kind of getting into that. It captures the sentiment that the people of the day would have heard. Like, if the person on the side of the road who had been beaten, if he had been able to talk, I could imagine him saying something like, just leave me here, I'd rather die than have one of you carry me. Right? I'd rather just sit here and suffer than have a Samaritan touch me. For Jews to ignore another Jew who is suffering, who is one of them, and then for the Samaritan to be the one to help. Like when Jesus uses this example, notice that the lawyer, how he responds when Jesus says, who should you be like? The lawyer can't bring himself to say, I should be like a Samaritan. He says, I should be like the person who helps, because he cannot compare himself to a Samaritan, because a Samaritan is one of those, and I will never be caught dead like that. Right? That, that's the sort of the racial cast to that, that parable. Like, I can imagine the entire people hearing this, this parable, like gasping, I should be like a Samaritan? Right? In America, if I had to pick an area that's like Samaritan-esque, the people that we always dump on and, and dog on and complain about, is the inner city. Have you ever heard someone say, the inner city, that's where I want to go raise my kids, right? Have you ever heard a compliment about the inner city? Ever. Right? And so, I have to tell you that I went to the inner city, and what I saw there are a group of leaders who are more actively engaged in service to their community than I have often, if ever, seen in any other part of America. Now, you can say, Andy, you saw the cream of the crop, and maybe there are exceptions. Okay, fine, right? Maybe my argument's full of holes, whatever. What I saw, these leaders, they were amazing. Their commitment to building the kingdom of God in the midst of the challenges that I have just described, the fact that they get up every day and still go out to love on their neighbor, for rural America to look to the inner, inner city leaders is like a Jewish person looking to a Samaritan, right? For, for rural America to look at the inner city for inspiration and say, we need to lead like that is right up there with a Jewish person looking at a Samaritan. You would never guess it, but I got to tell you, I was amazed by it. The way that those leaders serve and they get to know their entire block and community and area and, and they're involved, like they are involved. They, people are going to city council meetings, not when there's a problem, because if you go to the city council meeting when there's a problem, what do they do? Oh, thank you for coming. And then they politely thank you, then they leave and you're whatever, right? These are the people who show up every time so they are part of the situation and they understand what's going on and they can be part of the solution. This is a type of community leadership that I am in awe of. This level of engagement in a community is admittedly driven by need. They have to do this because it is the safety of their own children who, is, who are at risk. Like it is the safety of their own children that is on the line. And we have privilege. Now, here's the definition of privilege for Andy. Privilege is the ability to ignore. The, the ability to not worry about, right? I am a privileged white male. What that means is I have never worried about my safety when being stopped by a cop. And I have never walked across a dark parking lot with keys clutched between my fingers because I'm afraid that someone could jump me, right? I've never worried about that. I don't worry about the safety of my children. Talking to the, the DS of Baltimore, he just now he's serving a different appointment, but he was the DS of Baltimore for eight years. Black dude, Dr. Hunt, um, there were places he could not go in Baltimore after dark. 
Can you imagine that? Being the DS of Methodist churches and hearing like, I can't come to your church after dark because it's not safe. And, and every week he talked to his son, uh, guy's 25, who, uh, who lives in downtown Baltimore in that downtown part that's been revitalized to remind his son that you cannot go jogging after dark because jogging after dark while black is not safe. Uh, and he's ecstatic because now his son's moved to DC. They are doing everything they can to love the children there because it is their own children that are at risk. And this, if nothing else, reinforces in me that the charge to the church is to love other people's children as much as we love our own. Right? Because we live in an area that has its own challenges. There is not a single day that you drive around here that you don't see the scars from the 1980s farm crash, do you? Right? People who've lived here all your lives, you, you know the scars. You can tell me where the farms are. You can show me the, the rusted out combines. This is an area with a free, what's the free and reduced lunch rate here at our schools? I looked it up this morning. Uh, the free and reduced lunch rate in October 2017 was 57.3%. Over half of the children in our community at the middle school can't come up with two bucks a day to buy lunch. It's 51.5% at the high school, 53.47% at, at the Shelbina Elementary School. Right? To be like the leaders of the inner city is to love other people's children, to learn from them, the people we would never expect to learn from, to learn a bit about how to heal a community, is to do everything we can to love other people's children. And I wish I could clean up this sermon with a nice clean punchline. I can't. It was a messy week. Whew. <laughs> messy. I can tell you this. I was off, like, as I was flying home, these people had offered of their time. Like, they had offered of their time. This is the pastor of an inner city church. This is a, a, this councilwoman. It, it's uh, two lieutenant colonels and the city police. They have a lot to do. And they came and they stopped to pay attention to the, the ten pastors gathered, none of which are, are going to be able to like make a difference for them in their city. Like None of us are going to be on the west side of Baltimore serving them. They came and they offered us something. They offered us their story so that we could come back and do something. And, and like, have, you ever, have you ever noticed the weight of offering? Like When I hold up the offering, these suckers are brass. Like, these get a touch heavy holding up like this. And that's a good thing. Because when someone offers you something, they're letting go of it, like, it's yours now. I trust you to do something wise with it. But you came and you offered of your time this morning and you trusted that this would be a time that is well spent. In the same way these people offered of themselves and they're trusting that... Each of us are going to go back to our communities and share this burden and share this weight and share these stories so that we slow down, burdened by this weight, and be a little bit quicker to see and to stop and to help the people by the side of the street. Not in Baltimore. We can't do much to help people in Baltimore. But there are people here. There are people here whose lives are broken, and they're waiting for the church to get involved. Amen.